My name is Tori Nagash, and I serve as the Research Initiatives Manager at AKU Hawaii, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's funded research grant webinar, Equality in a Built Environment of Differences Towards More Equitable Residential Life Experiences. AKU Hawaii is committed to the creation and dissemination of knowledge about campus housing and the broader issues that impact the post-secondary experience, and we need your help to create these critical resources. A funded research grant program was created to support AKU Hawaii's goal of cultivating knowledge resources for members. The aim of this program is to encourage scholars and practitioners to conduct high quality research in support of the research agenda areas. Financing of up to $7,000 and association support are available for selected studies. If you're interested in applying or learning more, you can find information about this grant under the research and data section of the knowledge resources area on the Akuhawai website. The 2023 funding cycle is closed and this year's awardees will be announced next month. The 2024 cycle will open in March of next year. Finally, a few housekeeping notes. The live transcript feature is enabled, so you have access to subtitles if those are needed. This webinar is also being recorded and the recording will be added to the Aku Hawaii YouTube channel. Feel free to use the chat box to post any questions and I will now turn things over to our presenters. Thanks so much, Tori. I uh, really appreciate that. Hi, everybody. My name's uh, Josh Brown. I'm at the University of Virginia. Uh, physically, I'm in England at the moment. Um, Fred, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, Fred, can't hear you. Uh, I'm Fred Volk. I'm at uh, Liberty University. I'm apparently technology, uh, technology uh, uh, disabled in some way. I uh, can't work the mute button, but it's nice to have you here. I work in behavioral sciences. I'm a professor. I've been here about 17 years. Nice. Thanks, Joe. Hey, everyone. My name is Joe. I am a new assistant professor at James Madison University in the Department of Graduate Psychology, and I am uh, very excited to talk about all of the different research projects we've done today. Hi. Nice. Well, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us here. Um, We've got uh, a variety of studies that we'd like to show you. Fred, if you wanna kick over to that next slide. Um, here's sort of where we're gonna head today, uh, just a bit of an overview. We'd like to summarize our work, um, tell you how it came to be. Um, our vision for this is sort of a seminar, uh, graduate style seminar conversation. So we hope that we, you will use the chat feature throughout the time. Um, I know I'm gonna jump in when I'm not talking here and try to dialogue. We hope to also take some questions and answers, uh, both via chat as well as uh, video. And then uh, lastly, we sort of want to make sure that we just offer and present to you what we feel is a model or a strategy for trying to understand a, a really complex issue that we're trying to get our heads around uh, for at least the last decade or so, would you say, Fred? Is that about right? Yeah, I would say that we started working on this around 2010. Yeah, okay. Kind of in, in the initial residence hall designs of new residence halls. So, okay. Um, so let's, uh, if you want to kick over to that next slide, um, let me just give you a little bit of background. So this talk today, or this version that we're going to give you, it really builds on our 2019 study uh, and you can find that in JSARP. Um, I'm happy to drop that into the chat later as well, a link to it. Uh, but what we did is we, that was our first inquiry into residence hall research um, from a luxury design style type of um, examination. And we found some really interesting stuff, but one of the things that we were critiqued for and very fairly was we only had two races in our design and we didn't have any sort of economic uh, ability to talk to the socioeconomic status of students. And so when uh, the Akuho grant came around that Tori so eloquently um, offered at the beginning, we decided we would apply. Well, that was a 2019 and our vision at the time was we would try to find an institution that had a new type of residence hall, a new type of luxury residence hall, not just because our first one uh, sort of tackled the, the suite. 
And what we were noted noticing in, in sort of the design world and what was being built was this sort of hybrid design uh, where folks were being a little bit more intentional about the type of luxury. And what we thought was driving this was design. And that was our thinking at the time. We wanted to add income and we wanted to add more races. And so we submitted the grant to Akuho and all of a sudden the world turned upside down for all of higher ed. COVID hit. And I remember the phone call uh, that came from the Akuha uh, Foundation and they said, hey, uh, we really think that your work is important. We wanna fund it. And then the sentence continued and they said, because of COVID, we really feel that we need answers to the questions that you're asking. At that time, if you recall, campuses were empty. The stock market had plummeted. Foundations were trying to find money and organizations were laying people off in mass. And so for us as researchers, we really felt the gravitas of this work at that time. And so we set about trying to thoughtfully tackle this question. Um, and it's listed there at the bottom, which is in what ways are first year residence life experiences stratified by race and residence hall design? And because the world had turned upside down for colleges and universities, we actually had to go back and get more data. We went back to the institution that we partnered with. Uh, we had to get more data for fall of 2020 rather than spring. Uh, and this became real live research for us. And we had to rethink our methodology. Uh, we found an all-star methodologist, uh, Fred and I, to join us. We asked Joe if he would come on board. Um, and Joe really ratcheted this study up for us, uh, we feel. And between the three of us, we tried to ask what we thought were pertinent questions about uh, a world that, you know, how do you do residence hall research when the residence halls are empty that semester? It, it became a real challenge for us. Um, Fred, do you want to say a little bit about some of the methodology here? Yeah, and what I would and what I would say in terms of this is the first question we had to ask is, um, we took this, the world turned upside down, and all of our residential students instantly went online. Mm. Instantly went online and went online in ways that. Uh, that are, are different than traditional online because we had to have an institution that had both online and residential. And what we were looking at is how did this residence life on campus, people went to online, how many of those came back? How many of those re-enrolled and how many of those survived from an enrollment perspective? How many of those, because what we knew and it became very quickly that students of lower socioeconomic status, uh, black students, uh, Latino, Latino, Latino students, Latinx students were all struggling because of the multidimensional issues when they got home. They got home, they were in different kinds of households, they did different things. And so that was the first research question is, okay, how does COVID affect all this stuff? And then how does that interact with the resident's life, right? In other words, hey, what kind of residence life did they have before? And did that experience draw them back? And was that different? That differentiated by design? Was it differentiated by whether they were on campus or off campus or whether they were online? When you went back to online, was that differentiated in some real way? And so we really tried to peel back the layers of the onion. And key to this and where we were critiqued for the socioeconomic status not being a part of our data before, which is fair, socioeconomic status became a big question here, right? It was like, how did the money, how did socioeconomics affect whether people returned? Because the burden was great while people were home. No, no ability to earn money, no jobs. In some states, they were closed down for months and months, uh, even when they went back. So these are the things that were driving us. So the first methodology we were looking at was focusing on the outcome of returning. How many of those students came back? Um, it's interesting because we, the, we would focus on graduation. How did people go through graduation? But the reality was 
people fast tracked people to graduation during COVID because it was that disruption. And so you couldn't really do anything with that outcome, but we could say, were students able to persist? And that's the question. And how did that differ? How was that differentiated uh, for minority students on campus and minority students online? How did that make a difference? And so that's what we're after here. So we, uh, again, we worked with an institution who uh, really trusted us and uh, provided us with uh, quite a bit of data, seven years worth of historical data. So there's no surveys here. Uh, all of this data comes from the institution. We've, we gathered a lot of information about these students, their GPA, their course selection, their persistence, uh, their high school GPA, we, uh, their race, their ethnicity, their gender. We have a lot of information here and we started to basically just organize it and decipher it. Um, all of our information uh, or data about the students, uh, we anonymized it uh, to make sure uh, just for safekeeping reasons. Joe, is there anything else about our methodology that you wanna chime in on or you think we've covered most of it? Yeah, I think we've covered most of it. Um, I would just okay. note that, um, yeah, we had, we we're talking hundreds of thousands of, um, of units of students of real students and so this is large data with um not just a few you know factors or indicators for each student but hundreds of variables so this is a really really large data set yeah thanks uh fred you want to kick over to that next slide so here's where we're going to head uh today so when when we got this information what we decided to do was we decided to do uh very strategically we we decided to take uh, three different perspectives or snapshots of this data to try to help us understand what was going on. And so our rest of our time together, what we're going to do is unpack these studies. Uh, the first one's going to be a comparison of residence life and online. It, it literally it was just real life data that hit when the pandemic hit. Then we're going to slide down to what happens when we look at room change requests and those individuals who come onto campus and they're like, ah, don't want this. Uh, I really need to move. And then uh, our third one that we're gonna look at is the article that just hit. Um, and it is, um, oh, it's the one in uh, the Journal of College Student Development. If you'll kick one more slide down for me, Fred, great. And that's the one where we look at the three designs. Um, and I'll put a link here. Uh, if you didn't see it already, the Chronicle of Higher Ed covered our op-ed for our study uh, the day before last. So I'm gonna shift things over to Fred, who's gonna take you into study one. Um, study one, as I kind of alluded to, and what was interesting, as we took these perspectives, uh, the first thing we had to address was this, this idea of COVID and how, what the differentiated impact on COVID was. And when we, uh, when we wanted to look and we had to look at fall to fall retention, that is fall to, we compared and we compared two time periods. We compared fall 2017 to fall 2018, um, and that was our pre-COVID, uh, our pre-COVID cohort, cohort, cohort. And we paid, we compared fall 2019 to fall 2020, and we looked at only initial students, only freshman students. They're they're coming in freshman students, not students who had already an established relationship with the with the university. Only those incoming freshmen did they return. Uh, did they return? And we had four races, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. And what were the differentiating factors? Um, and this is, uh, this is the, and we all remember the milieu. How could we forget it? Particularly those of, in re, those of us that are working in residence life, where all of a sudden it's over. And then how do we do residence life when that campus is empty? Uh, what we found and what we expected, you know, really what we expected at some level is we expected these online students to be unaffected, frankly. They're already online. They're at home. They're cruising. They do this all the time. We expected our online students to really do well. They're coming back. Okay, that's good. That's what we expected. And um, when we looked at COVID versus pre-COVID, what we found is um, we found as a university that attended our, is that because university focused on their residential students in particular, moved very quickly to those, um, a great amount of resources were spent on those students who were formerly residential students 
and then had to do things online. Um, and we remember the challenges. Faculty that never did an online thing in their life uh, were now forced to use technology. It was like all hands on deck uh, to train up faculty, to get them going, redesign of courses, the works. It was, it was a massive effort by everyone involved. Uh, and what we found though, is those on-campus students were 2.38 times more likely to pursue their degree. So retention for on-campus students was two and a half, nearly two and a half times more likely than for online students, pre-COVID versus, uh, versus the COVID dimension. And it's sort of what, what's interesting about that is, oh goodness, those people who were cruising online, what we forgot in the, in the, for the university forgot when we were looking at those is, you know, students who are online are online for a reason. They do have those commitments. And we did a great job on our, you know, in terms of we, in terms of the universities did a great job at focusing on our online students or really our residential students are really supporting them. It seems to indicate that maybe, and in this one case, maybe the online students weren't focused on sufficiently. Maybe the online students weren't focusing on helping meet their needs. Uh, our residential students did pretty good as a rule. Um, and what's interesting is off-campus students uh, were less likely to produce, pursue their degree than on-campus students. And off-campus Black students uh, who are minoritized at, at that campus uh, were highly unlikely to uh, continue the degree when um, from an impact perspective. It impacted them very negatively in terms of uh, coming back and persisting. Um, if we think of pre-COVID versus uh, pre-COVID students, when we compare the pre-COVID students, white students and, uh, and Hispanic students, uh, they came back, they came back uh, at, at higher rates. But what we saw in terms of second year students, black students and Asian students, we're less likely to return. Black students, Asian students. Now, we don't have, our data is limited, right? It's archival data. There's, this inspires all sorts of kinds of research questions, right? We can, we can look at differences between campus and online, but what we see here is there was some level of racial stratification that we're not sure about and we don't really understand. In other words, we have all this data but until we start asking some questions of those students who did return, those who's students who didn't, uh, we did see two minoritized groups that were less likely to return, and that's Black students and that's Asian students. Um, do we know why? We don't know why. We don't know why they were less likely to return. Um, uh, but there were varying rates. And, and after this campus closing, which we would... I would say from a kind of a, a cleavage event in residence life for us to focus on students and residence life, there was a cleavage event. So there were unequal first student retention rates, uh, how it shaped students' uh, experience, but we do know that the campus got less diverse post, uh, post COVID. It got less diverse because those first year students were less, two of those minoritized groups were less likely to return. Our second study, uh, now this study, after we kind of began to understand, okay, pre-COVID versus uh, COVID, we thought, well, what is it about that residence hall experience? Was it is, what is it about the residence hall experience that is making, uh, that is making a difference, particularly for minoritized students? So, uh, we had in the we had in our data the ability to determine uh, when students arrive and they're beginning that experience uh, to track whether they lived in a different place the second semester versus the first semester, and we tracked that over time because we thought maybe for minoritized students on this particular case that there's a certain uh, residence hall experience. That is driving that is driving um, our, our retention rates, and one indication one indication of a negative res residence hall experience is 
potentially room change requests. Now, there are a lot of re reasons to change the rooms, right? Not all negative, not all negative. But there is this, this kind of idea that if someone's mid-semester, and those of us who work, in, uh, work with residence life and work in housing, we get mid-semester changes and those mid-semester churns, although infrequent, are costly because we got to find a place. Sometimes it needs to be moved quickly because there's such conflict in the room. So you, you have, uh, and we wanted to figure out uh, what are those factors that are driving, uh, driving those change requests. Um, and so we, uh, so that was what we were looking at. And we looked at GPA uh, in particular, we looked at student characteristics. So we look at age, race, and socioeconomic status. Um, miraculously, uh, miraculously, or uh, not surprisingly, when there's a difference in age, the difference between a 21 year old that lives in, a, in the residence hall and an 18 year old old is quite a huge uh, difference. So we thought the age difference might drive uh, might drive that as well. So we, we looked at ages. So we wanted to look at characteristics, similarities, and differences between roommates. And before I get into, re into results, I will add that um, a classification tree analysis is what we used here, which is really cool. It's kind of an advanced modeling technique uh, but you can picture kind of like a starting node and that's everyone and you may or may not change roommates, but then it kind of branches out and branches down. And so we're trying to find, are there pockets of sub subgroups uh, of characteristics unique to students that make them more or less likely uh, to request a roommate change? And so in our uh, paper, we have this, this really cool figure that shows kind of all the little branches that, that tease off, but um, basically the algorithm in the computer is trying to find, are there unique subgroups? Are there kind of characteristics that are unique to uh, students that are requesting uh, roommate changes? So off the bat, one of the first findings we see, likely uh, no surprise to anyone here today, is that roommate uh, uh, room change requests differed based on residence type, believe it or not. Uh, we saw that the lowest rates of uh, changing roommates occurred in the lowest priced corridor hall type designs, while the highest rates of roommate request changing occurred in the suite style halls. We also found that uh, high academic achieving students were less likely to request changes and that students uh, that had roommates of a different race were more likely to request room changes, but that was only true for kind of a specific subgroup. So again, students with roommates of a different race were more likely to request room change, but only for low performing academically, uh, low performing students in luxury halls. And so, there's, there's kind of an intersection of results here. Uh, our, our major implication is that uh, we think of this as kind of a two-stage stratification uh, that's taking place. We have these high-end luxury hall designs. These remain financially out of reach for many students. Um, that's just the truth. But also, kind of in addition, the second stage, room change requests result in fewer interracial roommate pairs. We see that. We see that... Um, students with roommates of a different uh, race are more likely to request room change. And in fact, we see that uh, often their new paired roommate is of the same race. And so we can think about kind of, again, this two-stage um, stratification taking place, that there are these high-end luxury designs, they're financially out of reach for many students, as well as kind of um, the same race or different race uh, roommate pairing and how that plays a role. I think what's interesting about this data is, is if we presume that the lowest cost residence halls are ones where students are have no choice, there's nowhere to move because these are the lowest. Uh, in some sense, at the lowest cost residence hall, the diversity that's there is that the stratification at that socioeconomic status, that low cost, the diversity that is there, that those students may, those students, um, those students, those non-minoritized students may benefit from that diversity in those in those halls from a cultural perspective, maybe not from a socioeconomic status perspective, but certainly from a cross-race, cross-cultural perspective, potentially. Yeah, and I, I will add again, uh, Fred hit on this earlier, which is that um, room changes 
are not necessarily a bad thing. We can think about them in uh, occurring in different kind of um, contexts, shall we say. Well, for instance, I mean, we eliminated room changes when someone was chosen as a potential RA or they were moved to a leadership position as an example. So if they room changed, but they that was because they were going into a leadership and RA position that was open, we eliminated eliminated those from those room requests from our from our sample. And do you want to move to the next slide? This is our final study, which I think builds nicely off of this. Um, we can talk about um, how we consider a roommate request change to be maybe a bad or a good thing and what the implications are, uh, but we, we kind of wanted to be a bit more solid here and ask, how does uh, residence hall design type impact student achievements, academic success? Uh, we particularly looked at uh, um, first year GPA and we were wondering, kind of, is there an intersectional role of residence hall design type, race, and socioeconomic status? Again, these are kind of building off of what um, reviewers in previous studies had asked for. And as we keep saying, fairly so. Uh, so we were wondering, is there kind of, in particular, we were interested in the three-way interaction. Is there some interaction effect between race, residence hall design type, and also same race opportunity. And how do all three of those come together uh, to look at academic achievement? And so some really interesting results uh, for, we looked at four different racial ethnic subgroups, uh, Hispanic, Asian, white, and black. For Hispanic, Asian, and white students, residence hall design played no role in academic performance. Kind of astounding, at least to me, again, for Hispanic, Asian, and white students, residence hall design played no role in academic performance. Moving on, though, to that fourth and final uh, racial ethnic subgroup for Black students, we again saw differential effects. This is getting at that three-way interaction effect. So for Black students that were in suite style designs, we found that it's actually beneficial in terms of academic performance. It's beneficial to be around more Black students. Yet, oppositely, for Black students in luxury designs, it was detrimental academically to be around more Black students. And so we took a pause. It's, it's kind of a mouthful to break down. And it's really interesting to think about that uh, for different racial ethnic groups, being around more and more uh, 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 hallmates of the same race may or may not impact your academic performance. And that also depends on the type of uh, design you're in. So for Black students in suite styles, being around other Black students was beneficial academically, yet for Black students in luxury designs, being around other Black students was detrimental academically. So as we're kind of pondering this and I think thinking about future research, we're thinking about, you know, is this actually more than a three-way interaction, which is already quite complex? Uh, but maybe there's a four or five way interaction. I think we can uh, differentiate even further. Maybe not all luxury design halls are the same and uh, the location on campus differentially impacts these. Fred, do you want to say more? It's, it's something we're still kind of churning around. Yeah, and what I, I, I think what this, what, uh, you know, I think there's a tendency, uh, particularly in, in, in our particular media, Twitter, Instagram context to boil things down to one thing, right? It's one thing. And the reality is it's not one thing. It's not the intersection of two variables even. It's three or four or five things. And that those things are, you know, if we look at the first study, it's affected by broader, broader social things, COVID and how that things. If we look at if we look at residence hall design and roommate change requests, it may be, it could be as simple as uh, some, uh, some residence halls have some form of racialization and going on that we don't understand and asking those questions. And I think from a practical perspective, 
uh, we look at these results and it's, it's, you know, everybody's hustling, everybody's busy. And in order to kind of understand these dimensions of race and socioeconomic status and different residence halls and different residence hall designs. And if you're on a very, fairly large university, uh, you kind of have a feel for this self-selection prior to, right? What students are gonna go where and just based on price of residence halls, you know, low certain things. So you have some feel about socioeconomic status. You have some feel as, as housing folks. So it's, I think it's, we have to, in this kind of um, environment, kind of stop and take a look and say, you know, it's not one thing. It's not two things. It's many things. And those of us thinking about residence life, uh, thinking about students' residence hall experience, what can we do to ensure that we're not mirroring, mirroring or simply reflecting the stratification that's currently occurring in our culture? The stratification by race, socioeconomic status, uh, that, that stratification, the campus is supposed to transcend that, right? It's supposed to transform that. The idea of, of allowing folks with lower social security and permitting them and opening the, the gate to make it less exclusive on socioeconomic status and race is to in fact enrich uh, those students, uh, not enrich only those, provide opportunity for those students that might not otherwise have it, but enrich those students who are already in the gate those students who are already, because their experience is less if in the luxury halls, our black students are moving out of the residence halls that are luxury, right? Those students in that one residence hall are having a less diverse experience then. Uh, and so those are things we need to think about. Those are things we need to think about as we go, okay, can we transcend the stratification that we see in our current culture and our current broader society? And that really is our job as a higher in higher ed. Um, so that's, those are the things we think, what kinds of questions can we ask? What kinds of, uh, what kinds of opportunities do we have where we see more cross socioeconomic status, cross race, uh, interactions that promote understanding and promote, um, a cultural sensitivity and a cultural intelligence in our student bodies that then they take with us and those effects are cascaded when they leave us. I think one of the things I'd like to add to the many of the points that both of you have made on this, I don't think the numbers were given, pardon me if, if I'm wrong, because I was multitasking. Um, one of the surprise pieces of data or information from this specific study was 51% uh, of all black students lived in uh, the, the cheapest housing uh, when we ran these numbers here. And that was a shock. The other thing about the cheapest form of housing was uh, the poorest students uh, gathered there and the average EFC was 29,000. And the more wealthy students who had an average F EFC, um, not quite double, but almost close, the average EFC um, was 56,000. And that's a really big gap in, in income or estimated family contribution on one side of campus or another. Um, and what this really forced us to do is to start thinking about other campuses, right? This specific campus, the gap between the highest or the uh, price on campus and the lowest price on campus was 3,400. So we started looking around. Um, some other gaps, I'll give you some examples. CSU Fullerton, 1,300. Um, Stony Brook University, 2,900 between high and low. UC Berkeley, 10,700 between the most costly dorm on campus and the least costly residence hall on campus. NYU, 15,000. Uh, Marymount and High Point University, $17,000. And in one year, depending on where you live on that campus, that's the cost difference and it started, we had to start to basically rethink the research uh, with these, with this economic data, with the socioeconomic data. And so that's, um, 
the, the two big takeaways you'll see or in the op-eds uh, that are coming out with this research are, you know, again, 51% of the blacks, students on campus uh, in the cheapest housing, as well as the poorest students on campus also gravitating to the cheapest uh, residence halls on campus. So um, anything else that we want to summarize on this specific study, guys? Um, I don't think so. I think we've sort of okay. moved on to the Okay. The bigger implications here, right? Right. So some of the takeaways for the profession, and um, this is where, you know, hopefully you all can uh, chime in uh, on chat as well, or we can take some questions. When we thought about, okay, what does this mean for student affairs? What does this mean for residence life? What does this mean for higher education executives? Um, I come from an assessment background. For me, what this meant was is that we needed to start to encourage folks to start doing uh, equality assessments. And what those look like is basically, if you are if you have a, a an office on campus that is doing KPIs or dashboards or bio data, it's really easy to run descriptives of, okay, what types of students are living where in which residence halls, um, and are there any inequities that we can see? What these three recommendations are trying to do, and this is the word that I hope that you might take away from, from this talk today is de-stratify. is it that we can do to de-stratify the structures that we've built, right? It's very rare nowadays to find a campus that doesn't have differentiated housing as well as differentiated tuition. And we need to start to think about the implications of those gaps. You know, when you when it's when it's ten thousand dollars to live on one side of Berkeley uh, or another, there's implications for that. So the first was is to establish a quality assessments at the onset of or whether it's right before students get or maybe when housing assignments are uh, issued. Um, what is what does the distribution look like? And you can even do this with scholarships. You can do this with a variety of things, but uh, starting to look at equity a bit more. The second is at some point, and you know, some campuses do this really well. Uh, my institution, Greek Life, is <laughs> sort of you know it's off campus. It's close to campus, but it's off campus, and it's it's just um, it, it's a challenge for institutions to tackle this, right? And you cannot tackle equity without tackling Greek life. Um, there's a trailer for the uh, the Alabama Rush documentary that's coming out on HBO Max uh, that uh, I would encourage you to take a peek at. You, you can find it online. Um, but just watching that trailer right before this uh, presentation here, I, it, number two just stood out glaringly. I mean, we if we're really talking about equity and uh, making the entire four years of the college experience more equitable for students, I think we're going to have to think about Greek life and what that means uh, from a stratification standpoint and de in being very intentional to de-stratify our campuses. And then third is to develop a contingency programming. I got this uh, idea from a university that has contingency budgets, right, uh, where the vice president requires all of the the executive directors and, and direct reports to have contingency budgets that, it, that if something hits, they have a contingency plan to quickly adapt. If we see a skew, if we see a stratification skew, if we see an un, unequal resources being uh, allocated to our students, do we have a contingency plan? That's sort of what, what we're encouraging here. If we can do it with finances, I think we can do it with the valuable humans that reside and, and we mentor on our, on our campuses. And so um, those were the three ideas there that we've, we've applied. I'm sure that many of you uh, who are in this daily have much uh, more effective ideas that we would love to hear those um, if the opportunity to allow us. So I'll turn this over for, to Fred and Joe for the research. 
Well, I guess uh, I think when we talk about what research is, uh, what research is necessary going forward, and I think, um, I think first and foremost is how are students selecting their halls uh, uh, over time? In other words, what's there? Do they navigate? And to some degree, some campuses have become essentially uh, first year residence hall campuses. Freshmen, they're here. And then by sophomore year, they're moving off campus or they're doing something. But we still see quite a few sophomores and some universities have a four year kind of model as well. So students can stay accessible all the time on campus. So I think examining how students navigate uh, the experience of residence hall. And if we think about their residence hall experience or their residence life of experience um, as kind of their river of experience through their college, uh, their college life when they're with us, uh, identifying those twists and turns and the points of interaction that they have that are meaningful to them, that are most changing for them and how that affects their behavior over time. Because maybe they've developed positive relationships off their hall and in year two, everybody wants to be together because they have this friend group and they're deliberately trying to get on a particular hall. That's not bad for retention. That's good for retention. And so examining that in a light that looks at it a little more over time. Yeah, I will add, uh, we're currently thinking about a, a, a research article that looks at uh, what we're uh, terming pathways. Um, it's just getting at the same idea, which is over time. Everything we presented today, which I believe is good work, is still kind of a snapshot in time. Um, and it's interesting to think about, as, as Fred's pointing out, um, uh, hall design type of freshmen uh, might be different than that of sophomores. And how do, how do students navigate through as they're moving uh, across time at the institution? And so thinking longitudinally, about how students are are navigating uh, all of this across time, which I, I think actually leads to point three, uh, Fred, if you want to pull on that, which is not only are students <laughs> moving across time uh, throughout their time at the institution, but halls themselves uh, have kind of a lifespan and change across time. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, and in fact, halls themselves, depending on the era that students are in, start to begin to develop their own identity. That's that that residence hall is is for this type of student or for those students. That's all the rich kids are over there or uh, or things of that nature or that that particular hall is where all the nursing majors go or that particular hall is and, and you get this kind of identity across a lifespan. But we also see and we've seen this over time. If you've been on campus any period of time. Uh, the sweet designs were the luxury residence halls at one time, right? The apartment type designs, they were more desired. And then we moved to higher end amenities and then uh, having those kinds of things. And, and then we build new buildings. And as we see something that's desired today changes over time on campus. And there's almost a life cycle to a residence, uh, to a residence hall is this is the it residence hall this year, the brand new one, the latest technology, the, the best study rooms, the best social rooms, the ones closest to the new dining hall, uh, things, of, things of that nature. So that in terms of uh, a lifespan, we see that. And the other, the other piece, I think, if we look at the second piece is, listen, uh, residence life professionals are hustling all the time. We appreciate that you're here, honestly, that you took time out in your busy schedule to come have this conversation with us. Um, you have ideas and you have feet on the ground kind of, uh, kind of experiences, developing collab collaborative action research relationships with uh, interested professors. And honestly, this 10 years ago, or gosh, now I think of Josh, 15 years ago, this developed based on, oh, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in this. Oh, let's maybe look at this for doing some research. Or this is problem on this campus, let's help them solve it. And developing that action research with uh, faculty on your campus or in professional relations or at conferences where you talk to faculty and you said, hey, we'd love you to do this research on our campus. Uh, we'd love you to do this kinds of analysis or look at this. 
identify those kinds of relationships either on your campus um, or with particular programs. Um, uh, I think, Joe, your program is a perfect example of a collaborative action research relationship with the broader campus on assessment. Um, yeah, I work, I'm very fortunate to work in a center for assessment and research studies, as well as kind of having a dual role as a, as a faculty member. Um, but it's, it's fun uh, is a word to work with people uh, around campus, whether they're in residence life um, or academic programs, um, or kind of in between programs. We're working right now with the Center for Global Engagement. Um, it's fun to bring in research expertise uh, with people, as you say, Fred, who have boots on the ground, who are there doing the work. Um, that's enjoyable for me as a researcher is to team up, uh, recognize that we both bring in expertise. Uh, and how can we go about answering these, these interesting, complex research questions? And I had a note here that I wanted to add, um, thinking about complex research questions. Um, you know, we talked about this three-way interaction effect, and it's, it's complex, but life is too, and, and we need to be asking those sorts of questions. We are interested, uh, folks we work with, are interested in answering kind of main effects questions, right? What's the effect of this uh, uh, hall design type? Uh, does hall design play a role in, in XYZ? I'm a big proponent. We always need to further differentiate and follow up with uh, further kind of more equitable questions, which is, well, do those results hold the same for different groups, right? Are the effects similar for different groups? Um, and I'm a big proponent of continuing to disaggregate data. We can't get at answering those questions unless we are disaggregating data. And that's necessary. Those kind of main effects, what's the effect? What's the result? Those don't suffice anymore. We have to follow up further and say, well, do those results hold true for this group in this setting at this time? Yes, no. Uh, thank you, Deanna, <laughs> for the love. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, yeah, I could talk all day about it, but that I'm putting that out there as a recommendation for research. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the important aspect of that is it's not, it's never just, it's never just one thing. It's never that simple. We, you know, a lot of people desire, oh, what's the simple? Well, it's never that simple. It's always this disaggregation. It's always this subgroup. It's always this subgroup to this subgroup and this subgroup. And it's always something broader, uh, broader. Even when we're talking about something that is a that is a tornado of the COVID, right? We still saw when we disaggregated different effects for different subgroups. And if we if we kept tearing that down, we saw it in a massive way, in a massive way. Um, I think what, what we'd like to do is we we'd like to acknowledge the uh, the uh, Akuho International Foundation for sponsoring this research. Uh, we like to think they got their money's worth. We got three solid <laughs> articles out of this, uh, a white paper. So we'd like we we'd like to not not that we need and uh, Tori, not that we're looking for any you know hey you know, the great work guys, but uh, we'd like to think you got some money's worth out of the out of that. Hey, great work guys. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and uh, the white the white paper is published in our bookstore now. So if you're an Akuai member or from a member institution, you can download that for free. So do you have that um, link by chance, Tori, or is, is it uh, easily I can, available? I can get it. Um, okay. You will you will have to log in or create an account to make the purchase and which purchase, but it's it's free. I'll uh, I'll get that and I'll put it in the chat. Okay. I think uh, the last thing I, I would like I would like to say is um, I think that's the first time I ever said that's the last thing I'd like to say. Um, but the last thing I would like to say is the reason we're motivated to do this work uh, is to be helpful. We we want to be helpful. We want to set our own biases aside, our own uh, preconceptions and guy, gosh, say, how do we help you folks who are actually doing the work on the ground, who are actually solving these problems and trying to figure them out? So uh, we appreciate, number one, your time here uh, and always appreciate your input. So if you have, hey, what about this? Uh, so we'd like to open it up if you have any questions or comments or anything like that. Happy to take those.
And you can just unmute yourself. Do they have that option by chance, Tor uh, Tori? Yeah, so if there's any questions, um, please chime in. Hello, folks. This is uh, Deanna C. Hughes over at Florida State. Um, first, thank you, three of you, for sharing what you shared. Um, I have more of a comment. So when you all were okay. talking about the surprising data speaking to the difference in suite mates environments, like suites as opposed to more communal environments, I automatically thought about, um, from a historical context, how a lot of individuals that identify as African-American or Black are collectivists when it comes to building community. So when you don't have separation or silos, you tend to thrive, right? Um, and it has a lot to do with the socialization. So when you did talk about like the suites, I think about the additional doors, right, that can be seen as barriers to build that connection, especially from a design standpoint when there isn't large community spaces. Um, and thinking about policy, you don't have quiet hours at times when folks would normally like to engage. Um, but I thought about that. I said, you know what? It may have a lot to do when we talk about the many different reasons, um, but that could be a potential reason why they were not benefiting when it came to the grade component. Um, and big ups to hall directors that create those spaces, right? Or reassure individuals that you have the space to be even when amenities do brag about the individualistic approach, right? The nice and the shiny and new tends to have more separations. Um, so I automatically thought about that as a potential um, barrier to why they were not as successful when it came to um, just academics and just all around holistic success. That's some great insights. Uh, thank you for that, Deanna. Um, I think those were some of the same thoughts that, that we ha had wrestled with uh, in trying to understand the suites uh, on the campus that we looked at as well. So it, I, I feel somewhat validated, at least at a, at a minimum. Um, Fred or Joe? Uh, I'll chime in. My brain went somewhere uh, as you're speaking, Deanna, which is what Josh mentioned earlier, which is this is not what we have and what we're talking about today is not um, survey data. It's kind of institutional um, data. And I would be curious. Let's survey some folks. Let's see how students perceive their environment. We might see very different perceptions. Somebody else have uh, somebody else have another question? I, I had I had put into the chat um, whether okay. you know how you had looked at socioeconomic status, um, yeah. which you responded to. But what I meant was. Um, you looked at whether people of you know different races were successful, but did you were you also able to isolate regardless of race how socioeconomic status affected outcome based on their living environment? Because you know there are there are poor white people, there are poor Hispanic people, there are, you know you know there are rich right. black people, you know. So it's like how did you know did you look at that all by itself, or did you take race because fifty one percent of black uh, of black students are um, choosing the least expensive housing. You took mm -hmm. that as proxy for socioeconomic status too. So there's, so we used EFC, mm -hmm. but we used right. EFC as a covariate. Uh, you brought something up that I don't think we did do, and I, I'll kind of defer to Joe. You know what we didn't do, Joe, is that, and I don't think we did. We test the covariate by independent variable interactions. No, we didn't. Uh, as you were speaking, Lisa, I was like, oh, we did that. We did that until you added in the final point. So we did control for, you know, estimated family contribution. And we see that. So our results are kind of no matter those differences, we find that uh, no matter differences in uh, socioeconomic status right. we find this to be true. But we did not do any sort of interactions between, say, racial subgroup and estimated family contribution to see mm -hmm. if there was kind of an interactive effect there. We did not do that, Fred. Yeah, I didn't think we did. And it's, um, it's honestly, that's, uh, it's, it's interesting, because probably if I were to do it again, I'd say, hey, let's test that exploratory wise, just to make sure, right, right. probably nothing. But and this is and this is uh, this is why this is why 
collaborations are necessary. Because if we're collaborating with leashes, you go, well, hey, did you look at the interaction? And we'd look at each other and go, oh yeah, we probably should have thought of that. Um, uh, because that's generally, I would say, oh, I always think of that. Um, <laughs> and I did not in this case. Um, so I'm the, I'm the contrarian who thinks of the one thing. So. The one thing, you know <laughs> that's what? Great. That's, that's why collaborations are essential, right? That's why they're essential because you get in your mode of, okay, this is what we're looking at. And this is, this was our critique. And then we thought we didn't think of, oh, with this analysis, we should check those interactions just to figure it out. And just to, and it would be a single sentence in the article. Oh, by right. the way, we did exploratory for these interactions and we saw no differences, right? That would be easy, right? Um, uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate yeah. you keeping us very humble, Lisa. <laughs> the other thought that occurred to me is um, you you talk about um, Greek life. Um, is the is the assumption behind this that wealthy students are the ones that can afford to participate in Greek life? There isn't a. There, that's yeah, there a, is that, an that's a fact there. that is just okay. yeah yeah okay. Yeah, and and just to basically open that realm up, and let's just let's just see what's there. So yeah, there's an assumption that needs tested. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. So I think we've got time for one more question, if we have any, or comment. Well, I won't force anyone. Um, I will. Uh, I will thank everybody. You can sort of see how each of our strengths play out on this team. I want to reiterate Fred's notion of um, hopefully there's some sort of collaborative work you're doing in your own area of administration uh, or research, wherever you're presently serving. Um, I've thrown a variety of options in the chat for you, some links. Uh, you uh, Actually, Fred, can you kick to the, ne the next slide? If any of you have um, any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us um, via email. And uh, they're there at the bottom. And we'd be happy to answer any questions uh, privately. But um, other than that, I'll reiterate what, what Fred said, which is, again, thank you for your time. Um, Fred or Joe, any, any closing comments on your end? Uh, oh, we do have, Lisa would like to know if the slideshow will be shared. Fred, do you have a, thoughts on that? I'm perfectly fine with sharing the slides up. Okay. And this is also a summary. Our slide deck is a summary of the report that Tori threw into the chat as well. So um, they'll, we tried to basically summarize it for you here today, so. Yeah, I think, I think you'll find Lisa, uh, the, white, the white paper covers this. Um, yeah. So if you, honestly, if you download the white paper, I think you're good to go. And so okay. was, is there a link to that white paper? There is yes. a link in the chat, and okay. if you'd like to save the chat, if you click on the oh, yeah. three little dots, the ellipsis there, there's an option to save the chat uh, to your computer, so you can have Great. all the links. Awesome. Thank well, you. thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been a great um, opportunity and pleasure to engage with you, and I uh, hope you have uh, a great afternoon.